Kia ora everyone and welcome back, this is Humankind, and today I'm looking at the early modern era cultures, those that come just before the industrial era. You can see them sliding along on screen now, you should be familiar with a lot of them, if not all of them. These are real hallmarks of history. Uh, empires and cultures from the Dutch to the Eardor Chinese, the Ottomans, the Poles, heck, even the Venetians get a mention. Without any further ado, let's jump straight in and review and analyse these ten cultures. For starters, it's the Dutch. Their trait is stock wisdom, remembering that these traits last forever throughout the entirety of the game, regardless of whether you change culture or not. They receive plus two money per traders, that's citizens assigned to economic activity, on all cities. You could potentially have four or five of these across four or five cities. It's a reasonable amount of money output, and it stays forever. It combos really well with their emblematic quarter, the VOC Warehouse. This thing has an insane adjacency bonus, not in terms of percentage stacking, but just raw output, plus 30 money per adjacent harbour, an additional trader slot, the standard minus 10 stability, and also plus 3 money per population. So there's a little bit of scaling going on as well. Unfortunately, the emblematic unit is a naval unit, um, but it, it's, a, it's a, a transport unit. So you can load up land units and embark them across ocean tiles. It also has a small ranged combat ability, uh, only one tile away, uh, and it increases land movement speed inside of allied territory. Uh, next up, we have the Eardor Japanese, an ace site culture, one of three that have a emblematic quarter that produces faith. It, it's a really simple one, plus two faith, minus ten stability, uh, and a little bit of nuance where you receive plus two influence per adjacent mountain. This quarter by itself is not great, to be honest. The yields from this just, they're not very scalable. Uh, I'm not in love with it. Their emblematic unit, the Naginata Samurai, is an anti-cavalry unit that receives plus five strength versus mounted enemies. Uh, and also its honor code prevents the army from treating. That could be uh, retreating. It could be a good thing or a bad thing. I'll leave that up to you. It's a very strong unit nonetheless though. I think where the Eero Japanese really shine, however, is their trait, Shogun's Authority. It provides plus three influence on districts. So yes, it applies to your emblematic quarter, but also all others. And like I say, this stays forever. I think you're picking the Japanese primarily for that, maybe for the Samurai. Next up, we have the, let me do this correctly, Hodino Shoni. I think I got that right. This is the Iroquois, uh, an interesting culture. Uh, they're agrarian, uh, as you might expect, and receive plus two food per farmers on all cities. A really nice bonus, and quite similar to what the Dutch have with money, these guys have with food. Their emblematic quarter, the Three Sisters Plantation, also provides a huge amount of food. At the cost of minus ten stability, you receive an additional farmer's slot on your cities or outposts, plus three food per adjacent farmer's quarter, nice adjacency bonus, and a flat plus five food per number of territories you control. So you can see that shifting from an expansionist empire into these guys is a really great way to build up quickly. Their emblematic unit is a gunner unit with stealth. Nothing huge to write home about here. This is a very average melee combat unit, 41 strength, a six movement and four range. Nice to have. Next up, we have the Joseon. It's the Koreans. And man, oh man, these guys are fantastic at science. Okay, it's the emblematic quarter that shines the most, the Seowon. At the cost of 10 stability, you receive a flat plus 7 science. You receive an additional researcher's slot to generate more science. And plus 3 science per adjacent research quarter. And per district producing science. That's a lot to comprehend. What you need to know is you get a buttload of science. Their uh, emblematic trait combos with this as well. Unfortunately, it's slightly catered towards the ocean, but you might be able to make it work. Plus four science on lake tiles and plus four science on coastal water. That's a really good buff for coastal tiles. And of course, their emblematic unit is a naval unit. It's a gun platform with the ramming ability, which increases its movement speed in battle and receives plus five combat strength for adjacent targets. Nice to have, if you're into it. Next up, we have the Ming, an ace knight culture with a really interesting setup. Uh, their emblematic quarter is the Grand Tea House. It provides plus one influence per district, plus two influence per adjacent commons quarter, and plus ten stability. They're one of these rare emblematic quarters that actually provide stability, again, to help calm a growing or potentially tense population. 
Their trait, the Grand Secretariat, reduces the cost of enacting, so choosing your civics, or removing, revoking your civics by 20%. Remember that that's for the rest of the game as well, regardless of if you change cultures or not. That's pretty nice to have. I, I wouldn't underestimate it, but also I wouldn't beeline it. Their emblematic unit, the rocket cart, is really, really fun. This thing is a gunner unit with suppression, so when you attack someone, they must either move or attack next turn. They cannot do both. Very powerful in the heat of battle. Uh, it has 45 strength, 4 movement, and 4 range, and you'll need a lot of uh, gunpowder. You'll need 3. Next up, we have the Muggles, who cannot cast Expelliarmus, but do have an interesting trait, Imperial Magnificence, plus 2% industry per number of territories within the sphere of influence of your capital. You can think of that as, as a percentage bonus with lots of room to scale, but something that's relatively weak by itself. Combo it with the Jama Masjid, their emblematic quarter, and you're away laughing though. You receive plus three industry, plus five faith, a nice bonus, and not often two uh, yields that we see comboed together. You'll also receive plus three industry per workers and per adjacent makers quarter at the cost of 10 stability. These guys are production powerhouses, don't sleep on them. Their emblematic unit is also wicked. The <laughs> Man, this thing is cool. It's a gunner move and fire elephant unit, so you can perform a, full move, perform a full move after attacking. It has 49 strength, 6 movement, and 4 range. An absolute beast. Next up, it's the Ottomans. These guys have a pretty interesting uh, trait. It's called Sultan's Realm, and you modify the attach uh, outpost cost by 15%. So when you attach a territory which has an outpost to a territory with a city, the cost of doing that is reduced by 15%. Again, nice to have, but not something to write home about. Their emblematic quarter, the Sultan Kami, provides plus one faith per district. That's pretty powerful because it's all districts. Also, you get plus three influence at the cost of 10 stability and plus three influence per adjacent district. This is a fairly nice district for generating influence and faith. Their emblematic unit, the Janissaries, is something we've seen before in many, many historical games. It's a siege mastery unit, so you get plus three combat strength when you're participating in an assault against a city or territory. That's pretty powerful. And it's a gunner unit, so it's a ranged unit with a gun. Nice to have and earlier than most. The gunpowder generation tends to be in the next era. Uh, next we have the Poles. They receive a, a pretty interesting network of abilities here. They're defensive in nature. You receive plus 20% fortification on garrison. Their emblematic quarter is really defensive. You get plus 10 stability, but that's it. Other than the fact that it protects neighboring tiles from being ransacked, so you can do some really funky things here and protect your most precious tiles. It's also a land unit spawn and is fortified, so it acts just like any other fortification. However, their unique unit, the winged hussars, are something else entirely. 45 strength, 6 movement, and 1 range. These heavy cavalry units are fairly unique within the era. So uh, if you want your heavy cavalry, I really suggest you go with the poles. It's a charging unit, so its targets can't retaliate, and it receives plus three combat strength if attacking non-adjacent enemies, so you can use your movement to your advantage. Next up, we have Spain. Uh, the Spanish, and these guys are pretty strong. Uh, again, we can see a strong influence on faith here. Lots of faith cultures in this era. Their emblematic quarter receives plus one faith per population, so you can get like plus 10 faith, easy with that, plus three faith per adjacent district at the cost of 10 stability. Nice to have if you're going the faith game. Their trait, Honor and Glory, combines well with their emblematic unit, the Conquistadors. Honor and Glory provides plus three combat strength on units that start their turn in non-allied territory. Go hard and expand, in other words, and you can do that with the Conquistador, a very unique unit. They're a gunner unit as well, so you do have the first mover's advantage. A slightly weaker at 43 strength, 5 movement, and 4 range. However, El Dorado is their special ability, which generates money uh, from winning battles and ransacking. It's doubled, so that's pretty good. Last but not least, perhaps one of my favourites for all the wrong reasons, because I don't think it's particularly great, it's the Venetians. Their trait is Silver Tongues. It provides plus one influence per number of trade routes on your territory. Note that these don't necessarily have to be yours. A great influence gainer. Combo that with their emblematic quarter, which provides plus four influence, 
plus one per adjacent market quarter at the cost of 10 stability, and you're away laughing with influence. I found that while this was an amazing way to get a lot of influence, I didn't really need it, because I already had a lot of influence. Your experience might be different. Their emblematic unit is the Galleas. Unfortunately, it is a naval unit which tend to be less useful. Of course, not in every game, right? There will definitely be games where this will be a powerful unit. Don't take me the wrong way here when I'm dogging on naval units. It has 39 strength, 6 movement, and 4 range. And it has a much higher combat strength in coastal waters, plus 11. This thing's a powerhouse in the coast. Thank you very much for watching my review of the early modern cultures in humankind. If you did enjoy this video, I would love a like rating, but otherwise, really appreciate you being here and being a part of our small but growing community. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Kia ora everyone, and welcome back to Civilization. Today we're looking at the industrial... <laughs> it's not even close to being right.